My name is Sam. I'm moderating the panel. We've got Maru here, who is, I'm sorry, I already forgot your title, um, <laughs> in Life Scholar at the Harvard Law School. Um, and then Mary, who is a researcher at the Data, at Data and Society, and Robin, who is head of, or executive director, fancy title. Yeah, um, who's the executive director at Data Governance. Um, so on that note, actually, the microphones, and we're all using handhelds, so it's going to be a little awkward. I'm going to give you two hand signals to help us make sure that you can hear us. If we're not loud enough, if you can't hear us, make this signal. And if other people can catch on and use the same so we can all see it, that'd be great. If we're speaking too quickly, because some of us are New Yorkers, <coughs> <laughs> that'll be to slow down, OK? Um, and I'm not going to read everybody's bio, because it's online. And you guys can, it's also in the program. So we're just going to skip that part. OK. Now we're going to get going. Um, we're really, since our panel is around data governance, we figured we would start with what, what is data governance. <laughs> um, so we're just going to start there. Um, everyone comes in with a really good mix of backgrounds. And so I think we're going to get a, some complicated definitions here. OK. So I'm first. I had no idea. Um, <laughs> Hi, my name is Madhu. Um, I'm currently at the law school at Harvard with a graduate program. Um, I was previously um, a public interest technology fellow at New America in DC. Um, and before that, I was in a think tank in New Delhi in India. Um, so I'm telling you all of this because that informs the way I think about data governance. Um, so just to give you an example, um, in 2016, we all heard about Apple um, versus FBI. Um, it was touted as a revolutionary moment. Um, it's the reason why the US has the Fourth Amendment, um, and tech companies play an important role as surveillance intermediaries. Um, but cut to 2018, we hear that Apple has moved um, the data of Chinese users to China to comply with their localization law. Um, it was also reported um, that they were partnering with a company that's run by the Chinese state um, to host those data in the Chinese servers. And we also heard, lastly, that they moved their encryption keys to China. So I think this is the dichotomy that I've been exploring. Um, and while we hear a lot about the first case, when Apple kind of puts up a stance in the US, we don't hear enough about how tech companies kind of operate in other jurisdictions. And I think that's the essence of how I think about data governance. Um, how do US tech companies script rules which kind of trigger um, these policy reactions from foreign governments, which isn't really a good idea for some of the foreign users. Um, and before I move on, um, just, just a random factoid that I found. So the country with the most number of users for Facebook is India currently. They have 270 million users. Um, and if you consider the Facebook users in India to be its own country, it's the fourth largest country in the world. Um, so even though when we're talking about US tech companies, we tend to think about US users, that's not necessarily true. Um, and I think this is what I want to you know, kind of keep capturing for the rest of the conversation. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Madden. I'm a research lead at the Data and Society Research Institute, which is based here in New York, um, which I invite all of you to come and visit if you haven't been to any of our events. Um, we're kind of in the same space here and lots of um, lots of overlap with the themes that are being discussed today. So um, I I feel like we've we've actually at this point in the day talked a lot about data governance um, from different perspectives. And so um, I feel like we have a challenging both time slot, but also like uh, content wise, a challenge to, to keep your interest here. Um, but I would argue that I think much of the discussion um, over the course of the day has largely been focused on sort of formal um, concepts of data governance, whether we're talking about policy or process or even design, I think of as, a, as quite a formalistic structure and implementation. Um, much of my research focuses on the informal uh, implementation of, of data governance. So it's looking at sort of the socially situated choices that people make in their lives as tech users. Um, so before coming to Data and Society, I spent most of my career at the Pew Research Center and um, working for the Internet and American Life Project. Um, which I started there in the year 2000. Um, so I've seen a lot um, and things have changed. Um, and what went from a fairly odd uh, uh, focus of study, um, studying the 
social impact of the internet um, is all of a sudden now a much bigger thing. Um, but all of my research, I come from a traditional social science background, mixed methods, um, is all really seeking to uh, amplify the user's experience and, and voice. Um, at Data and Society, I've led a lot of work looking at um, Americans' privacy attitudes and experiences, and in particular, how that intersects with socioeconomic status. Um, so I think a lot about, in particular, uh, vulnerable and marginalized communities and how they experience the reality of data governance in their lives, um, how we as a society tend to um, design our policies with an assumption that people will read and understand them and be able to meaningfully implement them in their lives when in, the reality is that they're facing a lot of um, really, really complex um, uh, you know, constraints on their time and resources. And we need to really understand different communities of users when we're thinking about data governance um, because the reality is uh, it is not experienced uh, uniformly. That's all I'll say. So, uh, hi, I'm Robin Burgeon. I run data governance at the New York Times. And um, yeah, uh, defining data governance is a little bit awkward. Um, not because I think the, the, the idea itself has changed that much, but what we do when we do it has changed a lot. Um, I think data governance has always been around directing data, directing the power of data, um, except that if you pick up books on data governance that exist today. They cover data governance as it was done 20, 10 years ago even, even maybe even five years ago, which was how to tap the power of data at all. So it's a lot about you know, naming your columns and having good you know, standard metadata and stuff like that because the problem back then in governance was getting at that power at all. And in what feels like a very short amount of time, um, it's now turned into, you know, being deliberate about the power structure of the economy um, worldwide, which is a little bit of, of a, a head spinning <laughs> moment for people in data governance, but also I think something that contributes to making the field a lot more interesting than it used to be, a lot more dynamic. Um, and so I feel that a lot of the practice of data governance, a lot of this direction of the power of data today um, has to do about really thinking about power structures, um, thinking about ethics at scale. And when I say at scale, it's, you know, it can be pretty easy to think about, for instance, privacy in between two people. Like I tell you a secret, you betray it. You've betrayed my privacy. It's an inappropriate use of data. That's pretty straightforward. But how does that work when you've got a billion users? How does that work? You know, if maybe, you know, you can think of the implications of collecting one datum about one person. But what happens if you collect that datum about a billion people? You can do very different things uh, with that. Or a billion, you know, data uh, data points about one person. Again, you can do very different things with that. And what happens if you keep that data for like 10 or 50 years? Um, that might have implications that people haven't thought of. So the idea is really thinking of the, the ethical moment and scaling it up in every direction and trying to come up with, you know, what the consequences of this would be with data. Okay. So the fun part is that the next question is supposed to be, why is this conversation happening now? Except they've already touched on that. So now I'm lost without a question. Um, I, I think, uh, oh, I, I think, oh. Well, we can still talk about so that. So basically we're going to continue expanding on the question <laughs> as we've already touched it. Keep going. Okay. So um, in that spirit, I'm just going to pick up from where I left off, right? Um, so, in terms of marrying the conversation that I'm bringing up, I mean, in, for large part, um, I think what we're hearing from the other speakers is this idea of how it's a cultural change. Um, maybe it's within teams, it's within organizations. Um, and as we're thinking about what American companies can do, I think one of the things they can think about is the intended or unintended impact that it has on countries worldwide. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, I think long before US policymakers got frustrated with, the, with how these companies work, um, foreign policymakers were a lot more frustrated. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, so essentially, the, a lot of foreign governments are trying to rein in a lot of these companies. And the predominant way that they're doing this is um, through this um, policy tool called data localization. And some of you might know about it already. But it's the idea of kind of forcing tech companies to store um, the data locally, or at least a copy of the data locally. Um, so China has been doing it for a while. Russia has been doing it for a long time. 
But now they're finding a whole lot of other countries who are definitely interested. There's India, there's Vietnam, um, uh, there's, you know, Korea is expressing some interest. Um, so what does that really mean? Um, and this is a conversation that a lot of people have right now, which is this cyber sovereignty, right? So before I get into this, I wanted a sense in this room right now, um, how many of you think it's okay for a country to mandate any sort of a localization? Do you think it's okay, um, let's say for Germany, to ask Facebook to store data locally. So I just want to get a sense. How many of you think it's okay to do that? Okay, okay. Um, I mean, I don't know how this would have worked out a few years ago. I think there was a vehement opposition to anything of this sort, but we're seeing that change um, slowly. And it is a troubling question to the extent that China is the best you know, model for how this is playing out. Um, but we're seeing a lot of other models come up in different countries um, uh, as well. So I think as we think about this conversation, it's about how we um, reduce reliance on American laws. So predominantly, this entire process is taking place right now because um, it's very difficult for foreign law enforcement to access data from a Facebook or a Twitter right now. So you have to make a Fourth Amendment request in front of a US judge, and that process can take years. Um, so I mean, as a result of that, we have had these countries kind of um, force them to store data locally, um, and I think a lot of the companies now, and that's what's changing to answer your question, they are willing to do it. So I think there was a pushback earlier, and that pushback has kind of disappeared. So we heard about China you know, censoring their search engine. I mean, Google's censoring their search engine in China. Um, but we don't hear enough about this regime, the fact that um, Google, I mean, Apple has moved user data of Chinese users um, to China. So this juxtaposition is what is brewing, and that's what is changing. Um, that is just no longer the conflict of laws. Um, that American tech companies subscribe to American laws, but there's an increasing conflict of interest because the growing markets are outside of US and they kind of have to work with different governments and that means they have to do what um, some of the governments are asking for. Um, so I think that's kind of what's changing the landscape um, globally that I thought could be relevant. And I will talk about what's happening in the US. Um, uh, that's a perfect segue. Um, so from my perspective, why this is shifting so much now. Um, first, I think uh, it's very clear when you look at trends in Americans' attitudes towards tech companies um, that we, after a period of largely unbridled optimism about the role of tech in our lives, um, uh, the public has shifted quite dramatically post uh, Snowden post Cambridge Analytica. So between 2015 and 2019, the share of Americans who said they had a positive impact about technology companies' impact on society dropped 20 percent, and that's unprecedented. It's also occurring uh, against the backdrop of a very significant uh, decline in trust in institutions more broadly. Um, and at the same time, the complexity of the data ecosystem uh, has been advancing such that our old models of notice and consent and, and this fantasy of individual user choice um, are simply breaking down. Um, and the what used to be a very common refrain from tech companies that individual users um, could simply you know, make an informed choice for themselves. Um, uh, and if they wanted to, you know, if they had a problem with the platform's policies, they could just stop using it. Um, that's no longer the case when you look at the reality of the expectations of the workplace, of education, of uh, you know, social engagement, access to government services, um, in many cases, you know, people are required to use these platforms to gain access um, to the people and the information that they need just to live their lives. Um, and so I think that's a really important shift as well that we're starting to realize that the complexity is reaching a point where we need to rely on more of a fiduciary model or um, some sense of, uh, you know, greater expectations of our institutions um, that, that are profiting uh, from this data. The third thing I think that's really important um, is to note that uh, companies and institutions, even research institutions as well, are realizing that data is not only an asset, but it's a liability. And so, and I think we talked about this a little bit on our uh, pre-event pre call, um, that that represents an important shift in the economics of this as well, right? Like when you start to look at the way data governance um, is affecting the bottom line, um, that 
that has started to motivate uh, various institutions, I think, a bit more. That's true. That's certainly true, yeah. Um, so the the way the the background I come from in in looking at the why now question for data governance um, is really from tech. I've worked a lot in in open source and open standards um, over the past twenty five years, and I think one of the reasons why it's becoming so important now is because it's become painfully obvious that we fucked up really badly. Um, and so you know people have been Sorry, saying is there that. Are rating on this panel? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> People have been saying that for a while, but it's reached a point at which if if you don't realize how bad it is, um, then you, you must have your, your head in the sand. And so there's been this sort of tidal wave of realization that we need to change the way in which things are done. Um, and I think this comes, you know, the fact that it took a while for this to happen comes from um, multiple factors. One is, you know, honestly, we were all heads down um, trying to work uh, to, to solve technical problems. And uh, there was this sort of very naive thought that if you built tech that could be used for good, then it would be used for good, um, which is really dumb, but it's it's how it happened organically in, the, in those communities. Um, and also, I think, one factor that, that we're only beginning to appreciate is that harms from data tend to be slow. Um, privacy harms are very time shifted. And I think there's one example that, that I really like of this. It's not specifically a privacy harm, but it's a, that's a privacy threat, is there's this really great article from 2007, so not, not that long ago, in The Guardian, which I forget the exact title, but it's something along the lines of, will anyone ever successfully challenge MySpace's dominance in social media? And when you think about that, you know, all the people who were using social media back then, it seemed painfully obvious that it was MySpace and nothing else. They were just killing it in the market. Um, it turns out that company's still around. And all the data they have about you back then, they still have it. And they can still draw inferences from it. And they might still be able to recognize you from whatever information they have in other contexts. And so because they weren't as mature as today's surveillance companies. They probably have a lot less than what Facebook has. There was never a MySpace pixel or anything like that. But if you, if you translate that forward and you know, think of reading 15 years from now an article about the, the anti-competitive behavior of Google and going like, Google, what's that? Um, but you think about the data they have. Uh, it's becoming very obvious that, you know, if they started selling it to insurance companies, then you would never get insurance. If they started selling it to universities to filter college admissions, you know, maybe your kids will be declined admission to college just because you didn't spend enough time uh, doing homework with them, which Google can probably find out. Um, and those harms are becoming increasingly obvious as they, um, uh, as they accumulate. And, and finally, I think, there's sort of a, 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 a the beginning of a realization that that we cannot innovate at the technical level if we don't innovate at the ethical level. Um, or, I mean, what's the latest big innovation? There's been nothing this decade. Uh, you know, people talk about blockchain, but that's from 2009. Uh, before that, you get the mobile I mean, mobile devices are kind kind of big, but nothing recent. I mean, machine learning is you know tech from the 90s that would just like throw more data and more CPU at, it's not, it's, it's, it's nothing, there's nothing radically new and, <laughs> object, I mean, we've had scooters for a while, <laughs> but we can get into that, but I, I don't think, <laughs> I, I don't think there's, there's major, like really radical innovation in recent times. I certainly haven't been excited by much that I've seen uh, recently and, I feel a lot of that has to do because we can't move forward unless we solve these problems. Okay, so once again, we totally planned the segue. Um, the next block of, of like stuff that we want to talk about is what the process of actually doing data governance looks like. Um, so there's actually an order that we need for this. We're going to start with Mary and then move on to Robin and then Mato is going to speak in. So. Okay, and I'm going to flip it into questions um, because I think I think we are still at the questions point. Um, I think I think we need to, as we're thinking about data governance systems, think about whether or not we're building it to be proactive rather than reactive. Um, are we building it to be iterative and participatory? 
um, not just human-centered, but centered on human dignity um, as a core value? And are we acknowledging and accounting for the fact that good data governance is not going to be fast data governance, which I think is one of the toughest questions, and it's come up throughout the course of the day today, this idea that whether you're talking about, you know, in, in a design team, the process by which you, you know, decide we're going to have a phase where we, we test it internally before we release it into the wild, whether you're talking about, you know, deliberating with, across countries to come to shared understanding. I mean, all these things take time, and that just runs so counter to um, what we understand and know about the economics of these institutions. Um, and I think we have to find a way to instill within a sort of like brand value, you know, environment, the, the realization that if consumers know they can trust certain companies to be good stewards of their data, um, you know, that they will be loyal and that will therefore have an economic impact um, and be worth that sort of um, short-term trade-off. Uh, if we can, I think, do that, that would be um, a huge win. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the of the... In terms of the process, I, I, I agree with Mary. I think we're, we're completely at the questions phase. I don't, I don't feel that we have a process really nailed down across all of data governance. Um, I, I think there's some sub universes of data governance do it do it better than others. So, for instance, if you look at the privacy space, I think they're getting to a good place. If you look at the contextual integrity framework, I think that's a very useful and powerful way of thinking about at least personal data, if not the whole of data governance. And I've been wondering if uh, people would start working on similar frameworks for other aspects. So, for instance, for the attention economy, could we have like a contextual integrity framework to think about attentional harvesting? Um, you know, thinking about agency and respecting agency. Um, there's there's a whole spectrum of things to to look at there. Um, same thing for concentration and and power imbalance. Is there a way that we could that we could look into these things. It, the, what's, what's really powerful about the contextual integrity framework, I find, is that it, it leads you to break down the situation into very simple components. And then instead of having this overwhelming situation that you can't solve because everything's bad and you're going to die, you can sort of like figure out that you can act on this tiny little thing and get to a slightly better place and then act on this other principle and, and, and also improve things gradually. And it, it helps you grapple with the problem in an iterative fashion, which then drives towards a process of, of, of improvement. So yeah, I think trying to build the intellectual uh, tools and conceptual models that allow us to break down governance issues into manageable chunks um, is, is the, the next big step, yeah. I'm not entirely sure if I'm the only lawyer here, but when I heard the question, how do we make it happen? I'm like, who should be liable here? So that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it right now. Um, and I think we heard bits and pieces from both of you about this. Um, so you, of course, mentioned the fiduciary model. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you know about this, but there have been scholars in the US who have been writing about how um, tech companies should be regulated like doctors are or like... Um, like lawyers are, that they essentially owe all users a duty of loyalty, and when there's any sort of a breach, the companies will be held um, liable. So that's interesting thinking for a bunch of reasons, right? Um, in many ways, if you look at um, the pre-CDA 230 days, before the you know, 230 of the Communication Decency Act came up, it was all about having like a general exception for all companies. And they didn't think that traditional liability or traditional legal frameworks have any sort of a place in the internet, right? This, this cyberspace exceptionalism that we had, like, I mean, 96 or 98. But that's completely come a full circle right now because the conversation's about how do we use existing laws to make companies liable? Because the new laws we have created for the companies has given them some sort of cop-out. Um, so how do we think of um, traditional legal frameworks for this purpose? And one of those, of course, is this idea of the fiduciary um, model. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the lawmaking does not happen here. It's external to the US. Um, so for example, UK released a report earlier this year um, on harms of social media. And they spoke about how they want to institute a duty of care. So it's kind of a similar language as this fiduciary model. Um, 
India in its draft legislation calls all tech companies as data fiduciaries. Um, and this is thinking that um, kind of originated from the US, but it's funny. So it's not just exporting the technologies, but the thinking and the legal terminologies get exported in other countries well before it happens here. So that's an interesting conversation um, as for whether the model, how do we think about that model in practice, right? Um, and one of the other reasons why it's interesting is that it moves the action from thinking about these companies' harms as public. Um, so these legal frameworks are more about privatizing the harms. It's about regulating the relationship between the user and the company in question. So it doesn't really address some of the systemic imbalances that exist between the user and the company, um, but it does help in you know, kind of securing the interests of the users. So I think in the interim, when we are trying to figure out like what is that one law that can append tech companies and you know, have them do what we want, um, there are these interesting models that are coming up um, that can privatize the harm and regulate the relationship between just the user and the company. Um, so I think that's an interesting trend. Um, the other interesting trend is this idea about community data. So I'm not sure how many of you have read, I mean, uh, read up on it, but um, this idea of pooling non-personal data from private companies um, and allowing governments to kind of monetize it or redistribute it um, of sorts. So, and the models vary, right? You have the French national AI strategy um, that talks about pooling data to increase the training data that they can have for uh, some of the AI systems coming out of the country. Um, there's a different kind of thinking about how um, in South Korea, for instance, how um, um, a class of individuals can hold a company liable for um, group privacy um, being breached. So essentially, I think there's a lot of innovative thinking that's happening on this front. Um, and maybe we should be looking, I mean, and, and we all know that it, the one posting the existential risk is Europe, right? If anyone's gonna be doing anything about these tech companies, it's gonna be you know, the EU sooner than you know, the US. Um, so I think that's an interesting conversation about how um, we could regulate tech companies. Yeah. Okay, so this is perfect. I'm right on time. Um, we've got, I'm gonna move on to audience questions now, um, which was kind of the whole point of our panel, to have more questions from you guys. Um, yeah. We're gonna throw that throw at somebody random person. who's ready. <laughs> Hi, uh, so I have a question about the, related to CCPA and GDPR. So like there was, a, there was a remark that there's no sort of like universal framework about um, data governance. I'm wondering if the, the existence of these laws is going to force people to come up with like standards or best practices, or at least that's the hope that maybe things will get better because they have to do it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they will. In fact, if you look beyond the CCPA, the, so the CCPA was drafted sort of, let's say, not necessarily completely very well. It was, it was sort of a rushed, yeah. um, a, a rushed piece of work, even though there's there's lots of there's lots hold that, on, that's on. good in it. Can we define CCPA? Uh, sorry, yes. So CCPA is the Consumer California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, which comes into effect next January and protects the privacy of Californians. GDPR is um, you've probably heard of it. Um, it's that in in Europe, and so the question was about whether these are driving towards frameworks um, of, of data governance that you know, help us have some kind of collective uh, universal standard on that. And I think, yes, um, there's a next generation CCPA that's being worked on called CPRIA that's supposed to be on the ballot in California in November 2020. It's currently polling very high. Um, and that, if you look at the current draft for that, it aligns a lot of its concepts with the GDPR. Um, and that I think that speaks to the power of the GDPR. It wasn't designed really as a sort of restrictive privacy uh, law, but it's more of a general framework inside of which to think about personal data and how it should flow and how it should exist and how it should be processed. And so if California aligns with the GDPR knowing that Brazil and I believe India also currently have um, bills either in progress or uh, or enacted that also align with a lot of GDPR concepts. I think we're going towards some kind of global nexus of approach to at least this area of personal data management. 
Um, I'm going to jump in here and not wear the moderator hat for a second. Another smaller example of how policies from one one location then impact and create standards for others is California has an autonomous vehicle data sharing requirement. Um, and other states that are beginning to do their own autonomous shuttle pilot projects reference that that policy for their own like RFPs and contracts with autonomous companies. Um, whether or not they're actually implemented and how much of that is lobbied out and like how much of the leadership agrees to it to actually enforce it is the part where it gets messy, but they they basically copy and paste pieces and then put it into their own RFPs. So as data governance evolves in other locations, it is definitely moving on to other places. Okay, now I'm gonna wear the moderator hat. Pass it on. <laughs> See, yeah, just throw it to a random no person. questions. <laughs> You're going to have to dance, guys. Hi. Does this work? Um, I'm interested in, uh, I think you guys touched upon this a little bit with um, data localization, but um, I, I guess, like, because what I'm really interested in is sort of um, if it actually is possible to have um, international regulation and governance um, and... I know that there's like some push for that, right? Um, and there are perhaps some systems in place, but I'm just wondering if it's possible considering the fact that we are so, I guess, um, deeply seated in the idea of a nation state um, and borders. Um, so yeah, and, and in particularly because most of this, most of the, the, the companies are coming from Silicon Valley or um, China. So um, I'm just interested to hear like in your personal opinion whether or not um, that's actually a feasible thing to uh, think about within the next 10, 20 years. I think we can all take a shot at this, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start. Um, it's funny you mention international rulemaking. Um, I think it was back in early 90s when Russia tried to move a resolution in the UN um, about how information can be weaponized um, and it can be used to destabilize um, countries. Um, and if I'm not wrong, it was the U.S. who pushed back and said, eh, that's not going to happen. Uh, we don't need a U.N. resolution for that. And that was back in early 90s, right? Um, so I think the framing of an international regulation, I'm not entirely sure if it's the right place to do it, right? I think it can be co-opted by interests, and it's difficult to extract commitments right now. Um, and I know for a fact that some of the policymakers um, in emerging economies don't necessarily want to partner um, with each other or come to any sort of a consensus because this a conversation is playing out in trade agreements, right? Um, a lot of the conversations at um, WTO is about how to keep your borders open and how data localization kind of um, um, breaches that particular commitment. So, and there has been no consensus on that. Um, so I think I'm not entirely sure we are there yet because it's a conversation about sovereignty. So countries want to retain that sovereignty and they don't necessarily want to part with it. Um, so I can't imagine a scenario of countries coming together to decide something um, unless they are like bilateral agreements or maybe multilateral agreements about how they can share their data. But that's, that's how it would work. And I agree. It's <laughs> unfortunately uh, no drama. Feel here. a bit pessimistic, but um, but as we were talking about earlier, I think um, you know, in thinking maybe a bit more just about starting with. The human rights framework and like agreeing on some core principles there, I think are that needs to be the foundation before we kind of get into data sharing agreements and, and considering if that's possible. Um, but then, of course, I do think about cases like what's going on in China with the surveillance and sorting of the weaker population there and um, the extent to which, I mean, that has become a huge lightning rod for, uh, you know, not just U.S. companies, but other companies who are engaged and involved in those activities. And, you know, it's when you think about stories like that, it feels impossible <laughs> to imagine um, cooperation. But, um, but I think that once you have enough momentum, um, you know, from, from other efforts, perhaps we can see some of those frameworks adopted more widely. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I broadly agree with with my 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 uh, my co-panelists, um, <laughs> but um, I think 
it's something that could happen, but how long it will take will depend on whether uh, the US curtails its local monopolies fast enough. So, because it is a question of sovereignty. And so uh, the current, uh, you know, pro-trust um, environment that has built Google, that has built Facebook, that has built Amazon, is really creating a sovereignty threat for the rest of the world. Um, these are market failures of, you know, the failures of American regulation in its own market. There is no longer a free market in America. And that is threatening uh, the sovereignty of other nations and their ability to develop and innovate. Um, if the US keeps doing that, I think we're going to see alliances of other countries coming together to defend their own interests against market failures here. Um, and that could lead to unity much sooner. If the antitrust you know, activities that have started um, bear fruit, then it will probably take a lot longer. But I think it hinges a lot on that. Hi, um, maybe another extreme of this question, but what about empowering the individual to own their data? Um, Can you speak up? Uh, what about the what about the individual being empowered to own their own data? <laughs> so there's been discussions, let's say in the genomic space, where you own your own genomics data. It's not, actually not stored by a sovereign nation or a company. What is the is there have been discussions around this idea of your profile, perhaps your social media profile or your New York Times reading habits is actually owned by the reader rather than New York Times, and they can opt in or opt out into being that anonymized or user as such, right? I mean, it, it depends on what you mean. Yeah, I'm just using New York Times as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's fine. That's fine. You can <laughs> throw stuff at us. We're supposed to be accountable. Um, but so, uh, uh, you know, I think the best way to look at that is not from the ownership of something monetizable because there's a hell of a lot of issues with monetizing your own data. Um, but if you talk about ownership of personal data, under the GDPR, it's inalienable. It's yours. Um, and there's nothing that anyone can do to take it away from you. Uh, other people can sort of like exercise local controllership over it, um, but that's as far as it goes. So I think if you take a GDPR framework to its logical conclusion, um, owning your own data is a human right and nothing can change that. And it becomes really thinking about who has control over the data. And that's a really difficult discussion that needs to be had a lot more um, today because we haven't thought of data control because data is non-rival. Like I can give you data, you can give it to someone else, etc. We all control it in our own little universes and that doesn't prevent anyone else from controlling it. But who controls it has enormous influence over um, you know, the destiny of that person somewhere, possibly somewhere invisible, um, uh, very much removed. And so instead of ownership, I think we really need to think about controllership um, when it comes to data. You, we assume you always own your data, but knowing who controls it, who has the right to independently manipulate it, I think is really the, the, the difficult question that we haven't figured out yet. Yeah. Chris Wiggins, did I remember that correctly? Well, this is oh, okay. <laughs> is this better? Is that better? Uh, to go even further in the radical notion, I mean, what about data as a workers' rights issue? Like ownership of our data as a workers' rights issue? I mean, I could certainly see that coming up as a, like, competitive, you know, kind of uh, advantage for certain companies who are, you know, eager to gain tech talent, um, I think, in certain industries. Um, in other industries, the power dynamics are such that it's hard to imagine employers uh, signing on to something like that. But um, I do think that it, it starts to get to the question of, you know, what kind of data we're thinking about and um, and how it's being used. So. I think the the health data example is really interesting. Um, that it's in my mind, sort of, just because of the history of like HIPAA and health data protections and like how it would be used. That feels more like concrete. Um, but if you abstract out and think about inferential data and predictive analytics and the ways in which, I mean, conceivably, a lot of information could be gathered about you or your affinity group, et cetera, without actually needing to hold your data. Um, and so I'm not sure those solutions get us away from some of the potential harms, particularly when 
I'm thinking about, uh, you know, uh, situations where people are scooped up in predictive policing and, you know, in unfair decision making around hiring, et cetera. Like a lot of, in a lot of instances, that's because of, you know, sloppy data errors in the data realities of people's lives that are not reflected in the design of those systems. Um, so <laughs> that was not a, a easy answer, but, um, but I definitely do think that the workplace is, I mean, workplace surveillance is a huge and growing issue. And, um, and there is, at least in the sort of like labor organizing world, there's a growing um, awareness of the ways in which, in particular, algorithmic management is affecting um, workers' lives. And, um, and so I do think it's a place to watch and that there is some, some definite potential and energy there. I, I mean, I, 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 I was about to say, I think any company that manipulates the data of more than X people should be under an obligation to let those people unionize. Um, and, you know, if, if, peop, if users of Facebook and Google were allowed to unionize, I think we'd see a very different world, yes. I just wanted to quickly add, and I think it, I mean, it's relevant to both your questions. Um, so we've had data portability for a bit, right? The idea that you can, I mean, take data from one platform and go to another. I'd be curious to find out how often people do that, because that could be an indicator of how successful this idea of owning data is. Um, but I'm not entirely sure it's working. I'm not sure where the model is at. And I don't know if... Um, I mean, um, in terms of portability, I think one thing that has been a shortcoming, at least in GDPR portability, is that it really is about portability and not interoperability. And so if you want the, the power structure around, uh, you know, controllership over data to change, you need to enforce interoperability. So for instance, if you could use a product that's not Facebook, and that you could still see the posts that all your friends make on Facebook and they could see yours, um, then the competitive landscape would be very different, right? Someone would build a good one that you pay for, you get privacy, et cetera. And this interoperability in the data exchange would mean that people would be able to leave because the network effects wouldn't lock them in. Um, if it's just portability, you know, if every month you have to take your data out of Facebook, go put it into whatever else, and it's not going to be the right data format, so you're going to have some transformation and it's going to change every month um, it's not going to make a lot of sense um, so yeah I think it's it, it, we need to go beyond portability into into interop um, there's there's a there's a bill there's a bill on the Senate floor I think being looked at currently um, for that it would be it would be great yeah, I mean I think that was insightful that's exactly what I was kind of looking at I mean who's enforcing it who's using it um, but the other thing that I wanted to add is um, Conceiving or um, looking at data as property is something that's problematic as well. Um, I say that because there's this doctrine of eminent domain um, that US law has as well, um, this idea that the government can essentially take your property for public use, right? So the same parallel, the same analogy can just as easy, easily be applied in the data ecosystem as well. So maybe recognizing it as an asset or a property um, may not be the best idea. Maybe as if it's for a community, it might be a better idea, but individually, you're kind of opening yourself up to someone just, either you sell it or someone buys it off you or the government kind of forces you um, to get you know, rid of it. So I think that's a problematic framework as um, well. Yeah. Do you wanna to go to Chris or do I have to? I don't, uh, okay, so this is mostly a question for Madhu. Um, we brought up section 230 earlier and cyberspace exceptionalism What's next for reinterpreting 230? So we've gotten to one stage in our collective state, which is awareness of the fact that perhaps this one paragraph is being misinterpreted for decades. Perhaps. So like, what comes next? Is the next thing that just judges have rulings and they say, I'm gonna make this ruling, and by the way, section 230 should be read this way, and then that becomes precedent? What's the next step for 230? So, so I think, I mean, this is what I heard from someone, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but about 99% of the case law on CDA 230 right now favors companies. Um, so there's very few case law where the same section is used um, to make companies liable. 
and that makes sense. It's a it's an exception, right? Yep. It's essentially about how you don't make companies um, liable. But for instance, recently there was a case about Grinder, right? Um, where someone um, essentially, and I think a jilted ex-boyfriend, um, put up this profile on Tinder saying, "Turn up to X's house." Um, he's willing to have sex with anyone who turns up to his doorstep. Um, and apparently, um, there were like 1,000 people who turned up to his doorstep, um, and they made a case out of it. And um, uh, the woman who represented him uh, recently visited Harvard and spoke to us. Um, and essentially, the court said, you know, Randa doesn't have a responsibility to do anything here because of CDA 230. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the problematic stuff, which um, I don't think should be left to case law. I think there should be some sort of a long-term legislative reform. So you're seeing it happen in Germany. Um, but that's not a conversation. I mean, it's starting with the California Privacy Act right now. But um, I think the only way of kind of moving on from this is stop relying on a law that's like 20 years old, right? You have to move on from that. Um, and I think that has to be the next step. Um, but it's a matter of political capital, right? Who wants to do it right now? I mean, I'm not sure. So, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I don't think it's iterate. I think it's burn it with fire. <laughs> And, nice the, and, the, and build, build something new, uh, honestly. And, and so you, you mentioned the, the woman you were talking about is Carrie Goldberg. Uh, I re highly recommend her book, Nobody's Victim, about this sort of issue. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very She's good book. fantastic, yeah. 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 Um, so we got five minutes and one last question. Okay. Maybe? Five. You're, you're first. He's closer. <laughs> got such an athletic audience. <laughs> so just to... Do I need this? Can you hear me? Just to kind of expand on that last question, what I'm wondering is, you know, because we live in a world with so many different diverse political climates, uh, yet almost everyone in the world, in fact, everyone in the world is impacted in some way by the internet, by their data being out there. And, and you know, even if, if they're not on social media, there's still a record of them somewhere, if it's a receipt from where they were shopping, if it's an email address, whatever. Uh, my question has to do with, you know, what if there is any type of legislation or, or uh, some type of uh, agreement that could be made universally, you know, between many, many countries to make sure that data is protected and then how can we hold these countries accountable if they go against that? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, five minutes. Go. <laughs> um, so I think the question was, how do you make companies liable but do it internationally? Yeah. How, well, more like how how can you, in terms of uh, in terms of governmental restrictions uh, or laws, what can be passed universally? You know, if if there is anything, and if if there already is something, you know, how, what's a universal way that that different countries, different governments, and different companies can all be held accountable as part of the same system. Okay. Um, in an international sense. Yeah, I, th I think one of the things, I mean, it's a, it's a low-hanging fruit, uh, but one idea could be companies coming together and having like a voluntary commitment. It sounds, um, it doesn't sound very smart given the, um, the climate we are in right now, but you can see Microsoft has done that with cybersecurity. They have something called the Peace um, Accord, and I think they have about 65 private organizations who are a part of it right now. Um, and as a part of that, they need to notify breaches, share information on you know, attack vectors with other um, companies. So there is a possibility that in this case, companies have the political capital to kind of bring the conversation together. Um, I don't think it's going to happen in the privacy space because they all run targeted advertisements. Um, so at, on some level, it's incompatible with privacy. So I'm not sure whether they can move this conversation forward because it's inherently um, contradictory to what they do. Um, but I feel like maybe that's where we are at. I, I don't know about states getting together. I really don't think we are there right now. Um, but if users kind of force companies um, to treat user privacy um, globally and similarly, um, maybe that's where the commitment will come from, from the companies directly. Yeah. I disagree. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, that's yeah fair. there's that's a disagreement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with you that I think a voluntary banning of companies might be a very good first step. 
Um, but I do think we can actually make that happen in a privacy space, even though some of us, uh, us included, run targeted advertising. Um, in fact, I think it's the only way, it might be the only way in which we will make progress on targeted advertising. Because, so again, I'm going to bore people with the GDPR, but um, it has this section called Article 40 that allows groups of companies, uh, a group of companies in a given industry to get together and say, hey, in our industry, the way in which it makes sense to to treat privacy and to process personal data is this, and to give like governance rules to go with, and to outline the rules and say, well, you know, in our world, it really makes sense that we do this, which in this other world might be creepy, but in here, it's sort of like accepted, or on the contrary, we're much stricter on these things. And I think with an Article 40 agreement of, for instance, online publishers, which I'm not committing to, but I'm very interested in, um, <laughs> Uh, we could get something, we could get new forms of targeted advertising that are not based on third party tracking, that are not based on extensive profiling, um, and that could like put some you know, guardrails around this and then negotiate with regulators and say, hey, we've put all these guardrails around this, we have this governance model, we have this privacy model, in exchange for that, can we get rid of those bloody cookie banners um, and, and switch from consent to legitimate interest because we're doing it right. Um, and so I do think I do think you know it's possible to build structures that motivate companies to actually get together and do things in a way that's user friendly, that's documented, that's contractual and binding. And yeah, I, I think we can actually get there in privacy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. We're done. Um, thank you, all of you, for great questions. Um, let's give a hand to the panel. Thank you.